If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. Today's guest is Hunter Doherty. Hunter's a coach and coach educator. He also comes in with a science and agriculture degree, as well as being an FEI technical delegate at three, four star level, and he's a course designer for both show jumping and eventing. How are you, Hunter? I'm very well. Good. Good to talk to you. Hunter, um, we normally start off with a favourite quote. Have you got one for us today? <laughs> a favourite quote? Yep. Quote that I picked that when I was about 16 off an Australian, off an old stockman. And he said, every time you're working with a horse, whether you're on the ground or on its back, he said, you're either training it or you're untraining it. Yeah, yeah, okay, so teaching it what to do or teaching it what not to do. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. And I'm sure that you've taught that to a lot of your students as well, given them that feedback. Look, it is a real sort of common issue, with, particularly with kids that lack experience or don't come from, from horse's background. They want to treat horses like kids and suddenly discover that, gee, <laughs> days of, of the flesh on the end of a lead rope, sometimes yep. not as friendly as I want it to be. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Now, Hunter, when you first started with horses, what are your first memories? <laughs> well, I actually started off with horses with a neighbour who had, had a horse and um, he said, if you can catch that horse, you can have it. We'll go on the next morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was about five. <laughs> so... I was essentially stole my first horse, and and that's how I started off into into horses. How did you actually catch it? Sitting on his paling fence all day with a loaf of bread. Okay, okay, well, pretty patient. <laughs> that's good. And and the horse itself was it a suitable horse for you or not? You know, you're coming in as a coach now. Tell us about was it suitable or not? Uh, look, the the long and the short of it is, it was the horse that he used to round his dairy cow up on in the morning. Yep. And um, I didn't have it for very long because he needed it back the next day. Oh, he did just he? Was under the assumption that he was he was the only person that could catch that horse, <laughs> <laughs> and, and Trixie wouldn't be caught by anybody else. But anyway, that that sort of sparked my interest in horses and and went on from there. But yeah, look, I not a person that grew up in a horsey family at all. My parents parents weren't interested in horses and essentially I started off in horses sort of in a more serious way by just being game enough to ride horses for other people that maybe they didn't want to put their own kids on or um, that sort of thing and just sort of went on from there. All right. Tell us about your agriculture degree. You couldn't find a horse course that you wanted at the time so that was the closest you could get. Yeah, I finished school in the 70s mm-hmm. and looking around at the time with the very much pre-computers and the information that you got was sort of print information. The only courses that I could find being in New South Wales that had anything to do with horses was an agricultural degree at Charles, well, what was Wagga Agricultural College at the time, had one subject in an agricultural degree, an elective subject on horse management. Mm-hmm. And that's where I started off my sort of formal education training in relation to horses. Now, for someone that's going to come into horses now, I mean, there's a lot more options. Yep. Absolutely, stack yep. more options, both within study and also within the industry itself. What sort of core skills or character traits do you think someone needs to commence in the horse industry? Look, the horse industry's changed so much in the time that I've been involved with it for, and particularly what is often referred to as the leisure horse industry, and that sort of pretty broad scaping from everything from, you know, Western sports and camp rafting through to your Olympic disciplines and, you know, the sports that I'm mostly involved in in relation to eventing, dresser, show jumping. Mm. The professionalism is, has just changed enormously. Like in the 70s, early 80s, when I was sort of starting to get seriously involved, there were very few, particularly in eventing, people who actually 
earned a living out of the sport. There was lots of people who had other interests, other business interests that were competing at the highest level. Whereas if you look at it today, I don't think that there's really any sort of of our absolute elite competitors who aren't full-time. Yes, it's a lot more opportunities today than what there was, you know, going back. Yeah, but it's also a lot more competitive to take advantage of those opportunities. Mm. So, yeah, there is a lot more opportunities and a lot more pathways. So to get a core skill that you really need, it's probably what you need is enthusiasm and commitment. Mm -hmm. And if you've got enthusiasm and commitment to the sport, you know, the opportunities will come. But, you know, a lot of people start and suddenly discover how much work it is and their commitment sort of wanes a little bit or, you know, they have to do something that they don't see as a suitable task for them to do and (laughs) they lose the enthusiasm. But, yeah, it's, uh, I think, probably commitment's the biggest thing that people need if they're going to succeed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the best thing about working in the horse industry? Well, I like the horses, and generally the people who are involved with the horses share that sort of enjoyment of horses. There's not a lot of people who that stay in the horse industry for any period of time who don't enjoy the horses, and I think for me that's the best part. Yeah, you know, I mean, speaking from my own experience, I think that's what's kept me in the industry. It is hard work, but yeah. it's the connection, and, you know, sometimes you almost got to pinch yourself, like, wow, I'm actually getting paid for what I'm doing. This is my job. You know, this is what people dream about having a job like this, but this is actually what I'm getting paid for as a professional. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And um, that's the way I've always looked at it. Uh, I suppose a lot of people wouldn't see my name up very regularly as, uh, you know, one of the leading competitors, but I've been professionally employed in the horse industry my entire life. Um, but in the education side of the horse industry, but still the common sort of thread of what people involved uh, involved in is the horse. Yep, yep. What about people who've influenced you? You know, I mean, think about the old stockman, but, but who else has influenced you in your career? Probably a fellow called Mervyn Bennett. He's, uh, <laughs> I don't see him much these days. Mervyn Bennett and Neil Laves are probably... They were very good competitors at one stage, weren't they? Yeah, they were like both Olympians, Olympic medalists, but just sort of down to earth people. Yep. And willing to share the knowledge that they've got um, or that they have and um, just sort of set a good standard and not only with what you do with horses, but how you address competition and how you address other people in the industry. Mm hmm. And what about horses? Have you had horses that have influenced you? Oh, look, I think every horse influences. You sort of pick up something a little bit different from all the horses that you have. For example, just got off a a big young thoroughbred horse that has been having a few sort of issues. Mm -hmm. You know, he's just sort of teaching me a different way of, of how I have to do things to get him to do what I want and just sort of adjust and so the one size doesn't fit all and you sort of change things appropriately. But, you know, you can always sort of think of the best competitive horses that you've had and they teach you certain things about competition and how to ride them and that sort of experience. But I think you often also learn from horses that aren't so good or aren't so easy that the lesson that you might learn from them is, is that, hey, you know, if I get a horse like this, it's not a horse that I'm going to be successful with. So if I'm really trying to progress, a horse like this is no good to me. You know, they'll suit someone else other than me mm, mm. and move them on as, as appropriately as possible. Yep, yep. Yes, it's still feedback, isn't it? Yeah. What do you think your proudest moment with horses has been, Hunter? I've got probably two things that stick in my mind and mm. for totally different reasons is that I was the technical riding operations manager for Modern Pentathlon at Sydney Olympics, which meant that the team was had to get or present 30 horses ready to jump a metre 20 track at Sydney for the pentathlon Mm -hmm. riders. Yes. And not only that, was that it was a sort of a bigger job than just the horses. Everyone sort of thinks about the horses, but pentathlon was almost an unheard of sport. Mm -hmm. So we had no real experience in it. And the head of the federation then and since has holds up the presentation of the riding at Sydney 
as the best presentation of modern pentathlon that he's ever seen. So that was pretty pleasing from the point of view of the team and my involvement in that team of people that put that together. Mm. And, you know, the other thing that I get a kick out of is standing on the podium with a competition with your daughter, either coming beating you or <laughs> or vice versa <laughs> and sort of filling the podiums at competitions with people that you coach. So mm-hmm. you know, I've got a couple of kids that I started off like young Andrew Cooper who's now sort of knocking on the door for Australian selection and you know, Catherine Davies a few years ago and so it's very sort of satisfying. Just going back to the pentathlon, how many horses did you have to prepare? Um, we had to have 30 horses up for competition. Sydney Olympics was the first time that women competed at the Olympic Games in modern pentathlon. Mm-hmm. So up until that stage, they only had to prepare horses for the men's competition. So we had to have horses that were front up on one day for the men's uh, women's final and on the next day for the men's final. So it was more than a challenge. Mm. And you know, from a horse point of view, actually, the, because it was the first time women competed, the women competed on the last day, not the men. So the men rode the horses first on the day before. Yep. And um, because of the show jumping is on one of five sports that the pentathletes do, so they don't train as much for riding as you know a straight show jumper would. Mm-hmm. So their technique generally isn't as polished Mm -hmm. and the horses they tend to ride, European pentathletes tend to ride very aggressively. So when they got on sort of Australian-based thoroughbred horses, rode them aggressively the day before, Mm -hmm. some of the ladies were going to have trouble the next day trying to keep them under control in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How much notice did you have to get them together? Look, about two years, not quite, but pretty close. Years. Okay. But that was from the horse aspect of it um, because you had to wait on, we couldn't sort of start stocking up on horses and we had an extremely limited budget. Mm-hmm. And to access horses, like how much we were allowed to actually spend on horses, it was a ridiculously low and small amount of money to spend mm-hmm. on horses mm-hmm. to, to do what we did with them. And we're just really lucky, you know, we had uh, at that stage. Greg McDermott was living in Wagga, you know, mm-hmm. an outstanding show jump trainer and coach. It was a very young Michael Lucas at the time who was a great little rider. And um, between those two guys primarily, and they knocked together a really good team of, of horses and they had, you know, we had people riding them. And, but in the whole scheme of things, the horses were a relatively small portion of the job, but it was what everyone got to see. Yep, yep. Now, where you are now in the horse industry, what do you think your biggest challenge has been? (laughs) The biggest challenge? Um, I I just want to put it out there, you know, because sometimes people who are thinking about a career in the horse industry, they want to know the good parts, but they want to know what challenges they might face as well. Yeah, look, probably the biggest decision that I had to make in the horse industry was, was very early on. I wasn't very long out of school probably the last year I was at school or thereabouts and I was offered a sort of an opportunity to go to the UK and ride full time for a bloke that tailored a lot of horses, like supplied a lot of horses to hunting yards and jumping and team chasing and all sorts of things like that and I had to then sort of make the choice, am I going to get a formal education and seek out a career or am I going to, you know, go and chase the dream, you know, like go and ride essentially full time and head overseas and, you know, initially I was going, hey, let's head overseas and have a great time, et cetera, et cetera. But I then sort of started looking at that stage, as I said, there's very few people that were cutting a living out of riding horses, particularly in Australia. Mm. And I wasn't 100% sure of how things worked in the UK because I'd never been there, but I'd met a few people who had, you know, were visiting Australia from the UK. Mm-hmm. And probably the biggest decision I had to make then was to say, ooh, I think I'll go off to our college and get a career and try and ride as well as I can mm-hmm. and sort of cut a living that way and sort of maintain what at the time I suppose thought of was just going to be a hobby and earn a decent living 
in the meantime. And that, to me, was the hardest thing. It's how to balance what you want to achieve from a personal level but stay alive, you know, like yeah, to, um, yeah. to have a reasonable lifestyle as well. Mm, mm. So getting a qualification as well, looking for the long term rather than just the short term. Yeah, and, you know, I'm over 60 now and um, I still enjoy riding. I'll kick around, a, you know, metre five cross-country course quite happily and I've got a course or two now that I'll sort of in the back of my mind that might go one star at the end of the, towards the end of the year. And so long as my body holds up, that'll all be good. But I also know people who I've started out in the industry with who now can't ride. They haven't started, you know, just the rigours of actually being a a top-end rider is um, physically difficult. And, yeah, so I'm an R. Should I have gone riding or should I have done what I've done? I'm not sort of disappointed I've done what I've done. Yep. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, two different opportunities. Now, I want you to put on your, um, you know, being you're an FEI delegate, course designer for show jumping and eventing, what's a common fault that you see with people that are out there riding a course and you think, why do you keep making that mistake? You know, and you might even put something out and you see a few riders making the same mistake. How do you think riders can improve their technique riding around a course, you know, just something that you see? I think that most riders and unfortunately a lot of coaches don't really understand what a course designer is setting out to do when they design a track. Mm-hmm. The basic sort of idea, my basic idea, and it seems to be in line with a lot of other people, is that you don't try and build tricks into any of your courses really at any level, but people ride it and sort of tend to say, oh, you know, he's done something tricky here or done something tricky there. or And so they sort of tend to, in some ways, overthink things. And realistically, you know, riders, competitors make enough mistakes for themselves on a course that you design. You don't have to build them in. You just sort of say what's appropriate for the level that we're competing at so that, you know, if, if it's um, a cross-country course, what's appropriate for a 90 you know, 95 centimetre track and what's appropriate for a one-star track. And so long as you've got a good idea of that in your mind, then you're sort of set. Now, the way that when a rider walks out there and, and looks at their track, now every horse, as we've sort of talked about earlier, is a little bit different. They respond a little bit differently. And the riders, you know, have to cope with the horse that they're sitting on. But you know, a lot of people don't understand that if your horse is galloping down a, a gentle downhill slope in a combination, the combination is going to come up a fraction longer than if it was on flat ground or even longer than if it was going fractionally uphill. So you'll see people walk out a, a combination that's on a downhill decline and they'll say, gee, that's come up long. Well, in actual fact, and, and then they'll tend to sort of you know move forward into it a bit more than they might normally. And, and wonder why it comes up really short. Mm, mm. Uh, so it's just sort of an understanding of what influences the way horses travel, particularly on a, in a competition. And I think probably the way the industry's going or has been going, um, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, I think we just have to learn to cope with it, is that very few people these days, you know, are like the... the um, <laughs> The Philip Duttons and the and uh, and the like, the, the, and the Neil Lavises and the Mervyn Bennetts that would ride horses to do all sorts of things, round up stock, play polo cross, you know, do whatever, and had a mm. very good understanding of what a horse, how a horse handles going down a slope of different inclines and things. Whereas now riders tend to be very schooled which, you know, really increases the class of their flat work and their technique when they're jumping. But I think there's sort of also we need to get very smart about the way we train riders these days to interpret or to know what was sort of like an inbuilt skill years ago was just how horses handle different terrain and, and that sort of thing. Oh, hang on a sec. Let me interrupt to let people know about the horse industry qualifications at onlinehorsecollege.com. If you have a look at the flexible options, there's online theory and the practical components can be completed by video or with a qualified expert in your area. 
That website again is onlinehorsecollege.com. Okay, thanks. So do you think that's more in the, the schooling of the riders? Can riders, if they were watching more courses and thinking about the technical aspects, that's going to help them a bit? Oh, look, it's certainly going to help them, but I think that the idea, you know, that nothing helps them more than actually riding it. Mm-hmm. You can talk about it all you like, but if you sort of run a horse down a steep incline until you actually work out, oh, that's what actually happens when we do that. Mm. Yeah, mm. so mm. it's variety in, you know, the terrain that they actually get to work their horses on. If you work a horse in a 40 by 20 every day of the week, it's, you know, <laughs> there's some pretty interesting studies that have been done about horses and their mental activity if you keep them within a 40 by 20 arena every day of their life and their learning ability. Mm. So, yeah, I think that, you know, the more variety we can get people involved in and sort of cross-training across sports that they're off, our elite competitors will be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, have you got a book that you can recommend to our listeners just to complement their training? Look, I don't have a particular book. I just think that people need to, to... in the horse industry, and I'm not sure about other, other sort of sporting industries, but I noticed in the horse industry that a lot of people gain knowledge from whoever is the flavour of the month as far as a competitor is concerned. In that, if Joe Bloggs is a competitor and doing a bit of coaching, we all rush off to Joe Bloggs. And that sort of lasts until that person, so you know, the, the students either realise, oh, we're not really progressing that well, or so-and-so is no longer the flavour of the month someone else is. Mm-hmm. I think people just need to be discerning about where their information comes from. And, <laughs> you know, I was having this discussion with a student yesterday, a, a young lady that has a horse that's starting to get a bit boisterous on her, and I said, well, now, what are you feeding it? Oh, I go to the feed store and they say this, that, and then I went to somewhere else and it says if I don't feed them this, then my horse is missing out on something. Well, you know, this horse looks a million dollars and it's sort of jumping out of its skin, but the horse can't keep it under control. Whereas, you know, practically, as I was trying to explain to her, that, you know, if that horse was just having, a, you know, a, a diet that was basically made up of hay, it's probably getting enough nutrients that it needs and it'll be trainable for the amount of work that it does Mm. with a minor amount of supplementation. But it's very hard to convince people when they see the amount of advertising and promotion that gets sort of shoved down their throats by all and and sundry um, that, that that's appropriate when everything they're reading saying you must feed them this and you must feed them that so i think that's that's uh, an important thing that doesn't doesn't only apply to nutrition but you know like you see all the the different sort of um on for want of a better word horse whisperers all the different training methods and things that are coming out and how you shouldn't use this person's method you should use this method you know Essentially, if you apply basic learning principles, then then it's going to work. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. It's, there's so much trend and, and fashion that it's. Um, but that's sort of what the horse industry is, and it, one of the things that makes the horse industry really exciting is like, well, look at this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard when people are genuinely trying to do the right thing. But uh, as you say, they've got to be a bit more discerning about where the information's coming yeah, from. And I, I think that's probably the the best sort of idea. I don't uh, like. I've never had an issue with students sort of being, you know, interested in all sorts of different techniques. The the problems tend to come with what I call disciples. You know, people that that have got the blinkers on, and it's only what such and such a trainer says is right. And unfortunately, you see that not only in um, probably the broader commercial industry, you also see that very much in sort of the animal behaviour, sort of science side of things as well. Um, It stifles progress in in research and things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. All right. Now, what are you looking forward to at the moment? What have you got coming on? You've talked about you've got a couple of horses that you might be doing one start with towards the end of the year. Have you got students coming on as well? What are you looking forward to? Yeah, look, um, <laughs> I look forward to every day getting up and getting on a horse. Really. <laughs> I really do. Um, I've got uh, <laughs> both the horses that I'm competing at present are the horse rescue horses by Groff out of um, 
sort of rescued from a very short sort of career after they finished racing, and one of them was too slow to even hit the mm-hmm. racetrack. So both of these fellows um, are sort of are going quite well. Um, Gary, which <laughs> which is probably the most the horse sort of that's most able, I'll sort of start him off, and um, I have to juggle my riding commitments and competition commitments around officiating and sort of sitting in FEI events to, um, that I officiate at. So. I just sort of plan through there, but I'll be looking towards Wallaby Hill in December with one of them, um, and he'll have sort of a 12-month program to get him up to there, and I'll have a pretty good idea of where my body's up to and by then to and whether I really want to take it on. But, yeah, so that sort of thing is what I'm sort of really looking forward to. I've got two couple of young horses that I've bred that probably will be broken in this year, and... We'll start them off probably early next year. And, yeah, I sort of always sort of like to see the young horses and I've got students that are we're sort of starting to map out six months and 12 months programs for and that's sort of exciting for them and exciting to sort of help them achieve some goals and um, we'll just see where it all goes. Okay. Now, in just a few sentences, can you sum up your philosophy with horses just to give a message to our listeners? I think that people have to be realistic about their abilities and a horse's abilities and what the commitment the commitment they're really prepared to put in with with their horse sports. They are, you know, essentially a dangerous animal and it does no one any good, the sport or the individual involved if people do things that jeopardise the welfare of themselves or the welfare of the horses. And I think lots of people overlook that and get horses out to compete before they're ready, riders out to compete before they're ready. And unfortunately, you things don't always turn out well. Mm-hmm. So I think that probably that's sort of the message. Do your homework, put in the background work and have a whole lot of fun. <laughs> Hunter, how can people contact you? Well, all my details are on as a coach through the EA websites, but I'm happy for people to contact me on my phone number, the 844-9174-787. But, yeah, I'm constantly sort of talking to people about different aspects of their horse management and training, and things, so it's all good fun. Those details will be available on horsechats.com slash Hunter Doherty, or else just go to horsechats.com and search for Hunter. Hunter, thanks very much for your time today. Great talking to you from an official's point of view. Um, Very interesting listening and talking about the pentathlon. You know, I mean, I was there and I I saw the men's pentathlon and I did think at the time, wow, you know, some of these horses are really taking these riders around. You know, the riders are basically just sitting there hanging on and, you know, there's been a lot of training going in. So, you know, as someone who was there at the Olympics, I certainly appreciated the uh, the work that had gone into the horses and the training and the preparation of the horses. Okay. All right. So thanks very much and hopefully we'll talk to you again sometime soon. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Oh, wait. Before you go, if you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below 